Wow. You know what you should never ever do in the middle of spiritual warfare is get pizza. I'm your host, Andrew, and I, what was your first movie that you got obsessed with? All right, like, yeah, okay, what was, like, the first movie, and, like, maybe not, like, I don't know, not, like, Star Wars, because obviously Star Wars would be me, because that would be the first, first one, but, like, maybe, like, early teens or something like that, you saw a movie, and you're like, whoa. Dune. Dune? Yeah. David Lynch's Dune. Mm-hmm. Um, Matrix. I mean, I'm of that age. I think I was 20. I think I was 20. I can't think of anything before that where I was so. Yeah. Yeah, Matrix. Matrix. Fight Club. Fight Club. Okay. Which is interesting. Yeah, that's a good one. Because I got super into it and super into the philosophy of Fight Club, went out and read the book. My copy was all beat up and worn out and had highlighted passages and everything. And I don't know how much of this is true, but the author went through back later and was like, yeah, that whole book was a troll about young men who get obsessed with ideologies. Yeah, who get obsessed with like extremist ideologies. And I was like, well, if that's the case, then I definitely fell for it. Because I was wholly into that whole, like, whatever nihilistic anti-consumer, like, shtick that that book presented. So it's, so it's meant to be, so it's like a meta piece of artwork, kind of, where, where he's saying, I'm going to present an ideology that's going to hook you to show you how easily you can be hooked to an ideology, now, something like that. That is what Chucky e. P is now saying. Okay. Let's see what he actually meant when he wrote that book. And maybe he's just a little embarrassed 20 years down the line. That yeah, he- but isn't that like this retroactive thing that's coming out about the Matrix 2 and like the red yeah. pill as like the yeah. transitioning pill? And it was actually the whole time it was transgender mm-hmm. propaganda, like that whole that's what they're that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying now. Well, it's that's like saying that. all the all the ip or whatever that's like oh yeah we've secretly been on board with trans rights and gay rights for forever look at this character we have that's like right you know whatever what do they call that retcon i'm not i I don't know what that stands for but it's like retroactive continuity or something like that so where where, i think that what retcon is kind of what was it in 1984 (laughs) was the ministry of information the ministry of truth we are at war with eurasia we've always been at war with eurasia retcon to me feels a little bit different the example Mm. i would give is that in the mid 90s they turned hal jordan into a villain in dc and they went back in like 2005 and retconned and say that that was actually parallax who had like the yellow weakness in the green lantern was actually parallax who like made his way into hal jordan so whenever he was parallax and did all the heinous things that he did that was actually not hal jordan but parallax and that's, but that sounds like the same thing. Isn't that the same thing that we're talking about? So, I mean, where does it kind ret- of? So, is this like a real life retcon? Like, is kind he of, yeah, like retconning? Well, and then I no, I think that's just called lying. I think you're just <laughs> lying at that point. Like, I think you're just embarrassed that you wrote this book and you kind of want to go back and say, like, oh yeah, I just I totally like, you know, oh yeah, I only really liked Bullet for my Valentine because I, it was funny to like them, you know, it wasn't like a big deal. I was never really into Slipknot. I just thought it was kind of funny music to listen to. It's like, dude, you're in the Well, in his case, in the case, what's P- Paholnik? Is that his last name? I saw it said Palinwick. Palinwick, okay. Palinwick, but I don't know if that's right. So Chucky P, call him Chucky. In his, Chucky P, in his case, it's actually a, a sweet business move. Because a lot of people will be like, oh, now I need to go back, especially if they didn't read the book. Uh, They're like, now 
oh, now I need to go back and read the book for his true, this meta troll genius of his. I bet he sold a bunch of books doing that. Yeah. It's almost like he wrote a new book. Yeah. By, ah. by changing the narrative. That You know what that reminds me of? That's like um, the people who turn their underwear inside out and say, see, it's clean. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that is, man. Yeah. That, is, that is all that is. Very, yeah. very weird. But I could see him doing that. That seems like the type of thing. So it's like, and then it's even better because it's like he, it, the fact, him saying that it was a troll is a troll. So it's just, it's like inception. There's layers. There's, There's layers. layers. <laughs> There's layers here, without a doubt. There's layers. Um, Indeed. Well, speaking of, trolls going back on their word yes like that there's a uh, something that we want to talk about and i think we're taking another break just for tonight are we break. though are we okay all right are uh, we though? because continue. where are we i was thinking about this on we power. are for, for on it. and suffered and suffered and was uh crucified yeah. for us also under pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried according to the scriptures according to the scriptures there it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, there it mm -hmm, is. Mm -hmm. So, all right. I'm just so that. we're so we're gonna have a conversation today, because well, maybe I can start this off, Father. Please. Maybe I can start this off. Maybe okay. blessed. That well, this week, I mean, it's 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 been on so many people's so many people's list lips. Mm -hmm. Not if interestingly, because it comes. It's about, well, it's about Joe Rogan's podcast, right? And it's about his guest, who was one of his biggest guests ever, who's been on this Carrot show, top. his show many, many times. <laughs> Carrot right? Top. Not Carrot Top. Not oh, Carrot I'm Top. To the wrong podcast then. Yes. Jordan, Pe Jordan Peterson, who from the beginning of sort of the rise of Jordan Peterson in 2016, I was a huge fan, right? Total, total son of Jordan Peterson. Um, I was about him very early. I had him on my own podcast. I think maybe the week after Rogan or something like that. But his first appearance on Rogan was December 2016. And he was on this week. And it was people were paying attention to Rogan's podcast because of, you know, Rogan had had the those doctors who were on and now people are protesting Spotify and Neil Young and now Joni Mitchell and some other people taking that saying we're taking our stuff off of spotify but theirs was about these other guests that he had had then he has jordan peterson they start out the first hour talking about stuff that jordan peterson never talks about which jordan peterson basically came out as a like what they would call a climate denier uh which jordan peterson never talks about climate stuff but and and i think a lot of people they got triggered by that so there's been a lot of that they talked about a little bit of race stuff i recently saw it Trevor Noah did a thing about a uh, race, but the one thing that I found interesting, and this gets us to this gets us to what I suggested and I wanted to talk about was Jordan Peterson spoke about he spoke about the Bible, he spoke about Scripture, which is not which is something that he's done. I mean, he did this very, very like well known and famous uh, series of biblical lectures. I actually so big of a fanboy, folks. I went to one. I flew up to Toronto. I went to one of these lectures early on. There was like, this is the early days of Peterson being, you know, out in the public. There's like 300 people total in this theater on University of Toronto's campus, right? So I, I remember I went 2017, August 1st. I, I remember when I went. And so he's been to, and he, that was all about the Old Testament. He talked about scripture this time, but what was interesting is that had I heard this, my previous self, the self that went to his biblical lectures, where I was, I felt like myself <coughs> well read on the Bible. I would have thought nothing of it. After my catechism and after becoming Orthodox, there was, it was throwing up crazy red flags for me, crazy red flags. And I just, I, I, I pulled out some, some clips. I mean, Father, you gave some very, and maybe we could talk about like, do how it. we're trying to how we're trying to approach this but well mm -hmm. i maybe if you could say a little because it was i put down a whole bunch of these clips 
I ended up taking out almost all of them because you, you know, you had very rightly advised, like, it's important that we talk about the spirit of this thing and rather than the man, which is what a lot of the criticism has been, his tone, what he's wearing, which is outrageous, all of these things. And all of those are a distraction away from the fact that he's introducing what looks like a new theology. Mm -hmm. Like it looks like a heretical theology that he's introducing. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it to you, father. If there's, uh, but that's, that's just, I wanted to set this up so that people understood this was my, this was my idea, but I think, I I I think it's important. I think it's a good one. Yeah. I think it's a good one. I mean, I think it's of the utmost importance um, because it's, again, it's one of the reasons why we're doing this project just in general, like uh, this is specifically something mm -hmm. um, that, you know, we've been talking about. It's specifically something that, you know, I have my own kind of story somewhat similar to what Cyprian is saying in regards of, um, you know, Dr. Peterson, but I mean, for me, even from really kind of from, I don't want to say from the jump, because um, like, for instance, I remember having an early conversation with um, my spiritual father in California uh, about Dr. Peterson, you know, and, you know, very enamored and people were becoming enamored with him. But, you know, I was telling him, I said, like, it's interesting because I've liked Dr. Pearson for the wrong reasons, <laughs> you know, like as an Orthodox Christian, uh, and, and this was before, um, let me just go to show you, this is before I was uh, a priest, you know, and, and talking about these things. Um, I was interested in because of, of the, his young and background, you know, dealing with young and, and the psychoanalysis there, I mean, and, and it was kind of one of those things where, you know, the, the dallying in something that I know isn't like good, but it's, it fascinates me in that, you know, having that background. Um, because for me, for, you know, we can talk about this maybe, but maybe not, but there is a, there's a, there's a, an aspect of occultism and young that I can't, that are indivisible for me. Um, and so for me, that's why I was just fascinated. And even his, um, um, that one book he did, the maps of meaning, you know, all that stuff was just, it's great. Cause you know, understanding where it comes from. And, and for me, I've always been, uh, this is maybe where the Mace Windu reference comes in, but you know, I look at that stuff and it's one of those things where I go like, this is dark stuff. No one else should read it, but I'll look at it because, you know, I like to kind of know what the enemy does and how he works and all that stuff. You know, I've always kind of seen it that way. And, and it's, it's powerful. It's very powerful. Um, and so I also, one of my big critiques was most people don't understand it. They don't know it. They've, they've never really delved into it. And then this is where we really kind of come up to speed. Definitely a good majority of the Orthodox folk I've run into, they have no idea what they're really dealing with on that level. Um, and so there, my big critique has always been this kind of like, you know, whole hog swallowing in, oh, he's, you know, he's talking about, you know, quote unquote, Christian morality and saving Western civilization and, um, you know, all these things, which on the face of them are good. But if you're not discerning from this is from my perspective, but I, I, I'll stand by this. Again, um, spirit of Antichrist isn't what you think it is. And the fact that um, it's tough because so much of what Dr. Peterson says is, is really good and profitable for people who are not Orthodox Christians. And it can be a good on-ramp for a materialist or for an atheist or for you know a nihilist, like it can be a great on-ramp. But the problem is, is once you're on the freeway, you gotta let it go. Because once you're actually in the church and thing with Christ, and this is what we need to really kind of get into, because he's using language and even, God bless them, Orthodox priests are 
not discerning, which we of all people should be discerning. Like when he says, when he says Christ, he is not saying and meaning the same word as when you, as what you should be saying as an Orthodox Christian, when you hear the word Christ or his name is being invoked, you know, in prayer, it's not the same, <coughs> excuse me. And, I, and, and so I, I just think it's important to understand as we get into this, um, because I hope people, I hope this kind of gets around a little bit, this one we're gonna do tonight, because this is one of those like kind of bells, I feel that needs to be sounded for people in the church, because there's so many people who have just like swallowed, swallowed this whole and not, it's important this isn't an ad hominem thing, right? But he is the vessel right now in which this is happening through. And if you don't, from my perspective, discern it, I mean, this is clearly for me a working example of what a, what a true antichrist spirit begins to look like. And I know that's like so hard for people to hear. It's, provo it's provocative. It's maybe, maybe we should, can you delve a, yeah, a little let's, let's further delve into, into it. that. Yeah. Let, let's delve into that. So, so when you think, when we say, wear a tuxedo. Exactly. The Antichrist will wear a tuxedo. I mean, I always imagined that he would. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> most I'm people, joking. most people, again, like I've said, most people think the Antichrist is the 500-pound crack-smoking black lesbian. They think the Antichrist is everything that they hate, everything that they find repugnant, whatever they find repugnant, you know, it's going to be the, you know, the leather-wearing homosexual, blah, blah, blah. Whatever, what, whatever gross whatever grotesque thing that they're going to say embodies and incarnates immorality, that's antichrist. And it's like, no, that's foolish, actually. Um, and I, again, Dr. Peterson, may, may God grant him the kingdom. May he, come to may he come to repentance, right? That's the thing. May he come to repentance. But let's just be clear, right? If you're an Orthodox Christian, right? outside of, you know, kind of like seeing how it could be some good polemical um, tools to help your friends and families who are atheists or materialists, whatever, you can't really subscribe to what he's saying. Because what it does is it leads to all kinds of very dangerous things. Antichrist doesn't mean against, but in the place of. And the Antichrist is going to deceive even the elect if it was possible. And that portion there, everyone thinks like, that won't be me. <clears throat> that will never be me. I'll see him so clearly. But I look and I go like, hmm, here's a man who even I like him. I like, yeah, this is great. What you said is great. I mean, this is why it's so important, Cyprian, what you're sharing is like actually being a true fan, like going and flying and catching, right? Absolutely. So, so this, this is really important because there's all these people like when the whole thing where he was there just trying to associate him with the quote unquote alt-right and white supremacy and stuff, it's just like, that infuriated me. It, it was just, that infuriated me, you know, because it, it was just the most absurd thing, right? And that that's that kind of knee-jerk reaction, all that stuff that happens. But this right here is very different because the level of discernment and awareness of not just simply what our tradition actually teaches, and not simply just who we are worshiping, but actually taking the time and listening to what people are saying and being quick. You know, it's like St. Paul says to Timothy, don't be quick to lay on the hands, right? And in many ways, he's had his hands laid on him. I mean, I've seen pictures of him surrounded by Orthodox priests and they're just like fanboying him. They, there was this Logos, uh, it was like a, the Logos Summit or meeting. I can't remember what it was. I remember, I remember that, yeah. It was like four years ago or something like yeah. that, I think. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was quite a bit of different clergy there, right? There was like a lot of different clergy at that. Was that the yeah, one? There, was Pajot people, involved in that? What's that? Was, was Jonathan Pajot involved yeah, in that one? I think yeah. He, yeah, he was involved I, I, yeah. with it. Which that's a whole other thing we'll, we'll get into with maybe. But for me, that was my moment. I was already, you know, again, I was like, well, I like him for bad reasons. I like him because he's really into young and, and he, he presents young in a way that most people, unless you've gone through esoteric means, most people don't care about young, you know what I mean? Or, or, acad or an academic context. So I've, I've always 
and I knew it was bad. But just watching him being adopted and people like, oh, it's great. He's talking about the Bible, all the stuff, right? And so he gets up and he, and this was my aha moment, my personal one. I could be wrong, but I doubt it. It was like, there was no preparation at all. And, and someone might say, and I don't know, you know, we didn't do obviously any pre-production on this. We didn't, I haven't taken my notes and like traced like, well, this is around the time that, you know, he was at the height of his benzo addiction. Like, I, I don't know all that, but I know that number one, he was definitely like, quote unquote, more unhinged than he usually was looking, right? But he basically got up there and he just gave a whole diatribe. Now, the, the point of this conference was the Logos Conference. And as I understood it, it was trying to present the understanding and maybe even some fresh, if it's even possible, some fresh perspectives on the Logos in regards of trying to combat the kind of postmodern deconstructionism that was happening, right? Yeah, and you, it kind you of got it. I, I, yeah, I, I right? remember it. As, uh, and so exactly what it was yeah yeah so the logos and the order and all that stuff right and if you go back i haven't gone back in a while but i remember watching it twice in a row being like did i really just see see what i saw and it was absolute maniacal blathering and at the end of it just everyone's just like you know yeah. and that was my moment. I was like, oh, this is, this is whatever, whatever my spidey senses were telling me. I'm like, this is, this was the proof I needed because watching academics and, and theologians, quote unquote, and clergy just like get into something where I was like, he didn't say anything. Like, he literally didn't, he didn't say anything. He just gave you a rousing kind of like pep talk, like a, a kind of a, a more maniacal version of clean your room type of thing. That, okay, forgive me, but here's the thing. From my perspective, the church is the guardian. We are, we are the heralds and the guardians, right? And especially the clergy. It's our job to not only just, not, not to only guard the sacraments, but to, to guard and preserve the truth as it is, or as he, Christ is the truth, that, and that's key, right? Is, is engaged and attacked, however you want to look at the interface with the world. So when, in other words, things that we quickly will sign on, never mind the fact that we are like 2% of the population in America, never mind all those things. Spiritually, right? Spiritually, we have that authority, right? So when you see that, an undiscerning lobbing on it it reminded me it reminds me a lot of what i saw as an evangelical where someone kind of quote unquote caught saved real quick some athlete or some musician has a bad night doing coke goes to jail gets out finds religion and like before he can even like you know see his parole officer the local pastor is like he's one of us and wants to like put him in the front of the cameras and everything do not lay your hands on someone quickly right so this is this is what I started seeing happening, and a lot of things which we'll, we should probably now kind of descend. I'm just trying to set it up. Should probably kind of descend into into the arguments because very clearly what was being presented: number one, cult of personality; number two, people not realizing that what's being presented is is more of a. It, it's kind of like a, you know, <laughs> forgive me. Do you remember in the 90s how they would take those kits for cars where it's like it would it oh, wouldn't right. be like the greatest car, but you put on like yep. the fender or whatever. And it makes it look like it's, you know, what I'm talking like a, about? They, they had a Fiero that you could turn into a Ferrari with a kit. Yeah. Kit cars. Kit cars. Kit car. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically what people it, it's like. It's Protestant. It's a Protestant kit, kit car. I mean, is it even Protestant, though? It's like, oh, yeah, it seems so set, but it's so secular. Well, forgive me, Protestantism is very secular from my right, perspective. Right, 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 right. Fair enough, fair enough. From my perspective. And, and, and what happens is that, especially what I've seen with this last iteration, 
it's very Protestant in the sense of, I mean, the approach to scripture and truth as a means by which an individual can find their own kind of self-validation and self-realization is so problematic. It's so problematic. And so this is the kind of, this is my own little diatribe that I just went through. That's what I'm laying out. But that, that was my moment when I said, this is a problem. And so I've been very passionate about it, not because I, again, the proof of the pudding for me is actually, I like a lot of what Dr. Peterson says. And I, I like the guy in general, I mean, was, you know? If, Father, when was that conference or whatever? I'm sorry, what year was that? Do you remember? Oh. I don't know. We should probably we should. 2017. I Maybe mean, I could look. I, I could look. I'll look it up. Somebody I'll look, look it, it up. up. Over. Sure. Yeah, I'll definitely look it up. Um, let me see. So it was like uh, logos. I think it was called the logos conference. Jordan Peterson. I definitely remember it. Uh, oh, there's so much of this. It looks like. Yeah, it uh, was March 2017, it looks like. Mm -hmm. March 2017, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's which was, that was really the, that was kind of the height. That was the height of Peterson mania. That spring 2017 was like the rise. So, yeah. Well, Andrew, you haven't seen the... Uh, By the way, Cyprian, you made it an hour in, which. Yeah, yeah I bailed about 45 minutes to an hour in. It was just it. It was weird. And Cyprian and I were talking a little bit beforehand um, about. Uh, um, about how like it, his demeanor and not in the not only what he was saying but how he was saying it and i and i told cyprian that one of the things that bothers me a little bit and you know i'm coming at this from a like a very very lay person perspective with little to no knowledge of like young or like really like to be honest at the time when peterson was making his rise i was woke so i was told not to like him so i didn't like him i never really got into him and by the time i had repented from that particular malady I was, he was already kind of in the weeds. He had already like really gone off the deep end. So I kind of was like, already like, well, I, this guy's just been bad all around for me. But um, it, watching that interview, I bailed about 45 minutes to an hour in. I was like, I feel like I got an idea of what's going on with him right now from a personality perspective of what's going on. Not his theology, not his philosophy, not what's coming out of him, but what, like how he's presenting himself. And one of the things that I said, and I'm not sitting here just trying to rag on him, but like um, one of the things that I told Cyprian that I didn't like was um, was that him and Rogan could even like agree about something, but Rogan didn't agree with that like in the quite right way. So now it just kind of indicates to me a little bit. It's like, hey, it's not even like agreeing in my general philosophy, but you have to agree with exactly what I'm saying. Otherwise, we can't we can't see eye to eye on this and then the last thing he threw out that like number like that like seven million children are killed every year by like indoor pollution or something like that particular pollution from like wood burning stoves and stuff and like even joe was like whoa no no, no that does not seem right to me and then like they looked into it and yeah it was completely wrong it was like their people are affected seven million people are affected worldwide um and so that to me, it's like, well, we can all throw out wrong numbers. I do that all the time. But it's like that coupled with the other thing, I was like, whatever this guy's selling, like, I could feel the electricity from here. That's kind of how I describe sometimes is when people are not doing well, when people are involved in something, I just, my skin kind of just, ooh, ooh, my spidey sense kind of goes off a little bit. And it, I feel like there's like a vibration around him or something like that. I just can't get into. That's kind of how I felt from it. So, well, we should we should also note. By the way, is my is my connection okay? No, it's is a my little connection okay. Yeah, it's bad. Okay, here's hit hit the hit the pause hit the pause and I'm gonna fix it and then we'll come back. Pause All pause right. the recording.
Okay. And we're back. All right. Good. Cool. If, if this is looking better for me, maybe we should start with the first clip. I can. So basically what I did is I've got, I just went through and it's, he, he spent time talking about scripture. He spent time talking about, I mean, those are basically the places that I've got. And I sort of organized them in a way there's, they're mostly in order. There was one that sort of moved up. They should be kind of in the order of him laying out this argument. But I think what I've got is the argument that he's trying to lay out about what is scripture? What is God? Who is Christ? And I think, so most of them are about two minutes, but there's one that's maybe about seven minutes. So I'll just start with the first one. This is about um, where he talks about the Bible. This one was where my spidey sense just exploded. It just exploded when he, when he. We've all three referenced spidey sense, by the way, which I think is cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's appropriate. It's appropriate, isn't it? We should okay. all that meme we're all pointing at each other <laughs> yeah we're all pointing at each other <laughs> <laughs> okay all right here we go uh let me make sure that i have uh let me make sure that i'm sharing the audio too share sound okay great okay here we go hopefully right so and in fact culture is a culture is a structure of category that we all share so we see things the same way. Well, that's why we can talk. I mean, not exactly the same way, because then we'd have nothing to talk about. But roughly speaking, we have a bedrock of agreement. Uh, that's the Bible, by the way. So I just walked through the Museum of the Bible in Washington. That was very cool. It's a very cool museum. So the structure, that's what the Bible Yeah, that's what provides. I figured out. I've been, I just figured this out this week. So it was a cool, it was a cool thing to walk through, because... It's, it's chronological. They have one floor, which is the history of the Bible. Mm. But it's not exactly that. It's really what it is, is the history of the book. Now, in many ways, the first book was the Bible. I mean, literally, because at one point there was only one book, like as far as our Western culture is concerned, there was one book. And for a while, literally, there was only one book. And that book was the Bible. And then before it was the Bible, it was, a, you know, it was scrolls and it was writings on papyrus and but it was we were starting to aggregate written text together and it went through all sorts of technological transformations and then it became books that everybody could buy the book everybody could buy and the first one of those was the bible and then it became all sorts of books that everybody could buy but all those books in some sense emerged out of that underlying book and that book itself the bible isn't a book it's a library it's a collection of books and so what I figured out was partly because I was talking to my brother-in-law, Jim Keller, who's the world's greatest chip designer and has now designed a chip that's as powerful as the human brain, which is optimized for artificial intelligence learning, by the way. And so I talked to him about that. He said, you heard of the Internet? I said, yeah, Jim, I've heard of the Internet. He said, this is way more revolutionary than that. So in any case, we were talking about meaning in text because we were talking about translation and the problem of understanding text and Jim said the meaning of words is coded in the relationship of the words to one another and the postmodernists make that case that all meaning is derived from the relationship between words that's, that's wrong because well what about rage that's not words and what about moving your hand that's not words so it's wrong mm -hmm. but but part of it's right because the meaning we derive from the verbal domain is encoded in the relationship between words. So, so now then you think, well, let's think about the relationship between words. Well, some words are dependent on other words. Some ideas are dependent on other ideas. The more ideas are dependent on a given idea, the more fundamental that idea is. By de that's a definition of fundamental. So now imagine you have an aggregation of texts in a civilization. You say, which are the fundamental texts? And the answer is, the texts upon which most other texts depend. And so you'd put Shakespeare way in there in English because so many texts are dependent on Shakespeare's literary revelations. And Milton would be in that category, and Dante would be in that category, at least in translation. Fundamental authors, part of the Western canon, not because of the arbitrary dictates of power, but because those texts influenced more other texts. And then you think about that as a hierarchy, okay, with the Bible at its base which is certainly the case, 
Now imagine that's the entire corpus of, ling of linguistic production, all things considered. Now how do you understand that? Like literally, how do you understand that? The answer is, you sample it by reading and listening to stories and listening to people talk. You sample that whole domain, you build a low resolution representation of that in your, inside you, and then you listen and see through that. And so it isn't that the Bible is true. It's that the Bible is the precondition for the manifestation of truth. That was... I think it's pretty, it's pretty appropriate for... It's pretty appropriate for this show, since we talk about like a lot of other stories, including like comic books and all of that. But that the last thing there was the, the part that made my spidey sense tingle because... When he says the, the Bible is the prerequisite for the manifestation of truth, but the, the Bible is a manifestation of truth. The prerequisite for the Bible to exist is Christ. Amen. All right. I know you guys are going to have a lot to say about this, so I'm just going to chime in really, really quick. That if I were sitting opposite this man talking, I'd be like, just, this is Andrew. I'd just be like, oh, boy, this guy's not doing very well. <laughs> Like, just like, just the way, oh. the way he's talking, I'd be like, he just doesn't seem like he's doing very well. And then I how was, so, how so, how so that thing about him talking about in the middle of like dropping his brother-in-law's name, which by the way, like I wanted to go through and I don't know, maybe it wasn't this one, but I wanted to go through and count the name drops of like people he was name dropping like, by the way, this person and this person and this person, and just like throwing that in the middle of a conversation. I don't know if I'm right, but it seems like he knew that what he was about to say didn't have much merit. So he needed to throw merit in there, like by for like providing like credentials for himself that he's like related to this guy that's like inventing something that's as revolutionary as the internet. And it's like, why did you need to say that? Like, that's not like really that important. So I would smile politely and wait for him to leave and shut the door and cross myself and just be like, oh boy. God be with them. So that's well, my. Well, actually, I think you bring up a good point, but you're a little off on it insofar as the context is very important. That mm -hmm. may apply to somebody that we will run into in that sense. It doesn't apply to him. And, and here's, what, here's what I mean by that. And maybe I could be wrong on this, but. I wouldn't consider that necessarily. Um, I wouldn't necessarily look at that as a condition of um, anxiety, social anxiety, or um, you know, a precondition of or, or anything like that. I look at it pulling back a little bit, um, just to kind of be kind of plain. And I, I may have to walk some of this back, but it's part of what's troubling to me because number one, that statement, nothing about that for me where I stand from my worldview is good. When you start talking to me about- It's trans, gyms, transhumanism. It, I, the transhumanism, like it's like it's a cool thing that this is, this is, it's one of those things where, and this is the, this is the um, form for it, right? This is the audience for it. So I'm just gonna say it that proves my point. Mm -hmm. Maybe not, may, let me, I'll even walk that back. That is maybe not proving my point, but for me, it's just one more bit of evidence for my, for me being like, something's off. That's right. That's what I pick my, I would say, if I had to say something really quick, it would just be, it is apparent that your house is built on sand, not rock. Like that's kind of how I felt about it was it's just like, it's just apparent that like you're and our life is not based on anything of real merit. So. Now, now here's the thing. I just, I want to get to this point too, because this is a season. There's a lot going on right now, obviously, because of 2020, quote unquote, the apocalypse and all the wrong and right ways people interpret the word antichrist, like all that stuff is in the air right now. And even since 2020, right now, as we speak, um, well, you know, proverbially speaking, but this interview came out what last week or this week, whatever. Like three days ago. Three days yeah. ago. It, it's just, 
I'm all about just pulling back, right? This is our form, right? Um, Father Peter Hears just started his series on Revelation. Um, uh, so there, there's, there's a lot going on right now. And I, we have to be aware of that. You know, I'm not trying to make connections in, in an unsober way, but I'm just saying, if, if you're paying attention, the energy is definitely up right now. You know what I mean? On, on, a, on a bigger scale, right? Just to kind of, what are you talking about? Just to flesh it out, right? You know, Father Peter doing the series on that. It's, it's causing a lot of orthodox or at least those who are really trying to discern the times, his timing and putting it out there. I think it's, I think it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. This, this interview with Dr. Jordan Peterson coming out and then subsequently, I don't know if we're going to get into that, but I know for a fact there was at least one Orthodox, you know, speaker who made a comment on it, you know, putting it forward as a very good thing. Other, you know, evangelical Bible commentators commenting on it, really promoting it without any critique. This right? talk, you're talking about this talk promoting this, this talk from, from actually from, that clip, that clip, that and there's clip. more. There's, there's, more. there's more. Yeah, there's more. There's about five more. There's more. But I want to get to this because this is one of those things where that bit of transhumanism unabashedly just slipped in there, right? No one, are what, are people not catching that? Well, people say like, well, that's whatever. And I know people say this to me because this is what they used to say to me about the other stuff, right? Well, you're just being too sensitive. You're just being too hypercritical. And I'm just like, especially, you know, if you're clergy, especially, that's your job is mm -hmm. to be hypercritical of these things. Vigilance. It's vigilance. It's it's vigilance. And I I'm I'm so familiar with the desperation, which I, I don't like it, but I just for my brothers that I that I encounter and I can smell the desperation of just wanting so badly to get a win for the culture war. That's not our fight. Sure. And 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 it's so people want to leaders in the church people they want to look at peterson as this as this like yes he's 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 so close to the kingdom and he's kind of one of ours and this and that it's like no because it's it's this desperate this desperate desire for validation this desperate desire to strike back at the terrible liberals and all this stuff and it's like it is a really bad setup it's a really anyways but father, father there was there's a uh, a quote. It was actually shared the first time I think I ever saw this piece uh, from Saint Nikolai Vilimirovich. First time I ever saw it was shared by um, Stu, mm -hmm. and because um, I know that right now there are some some Protestants uh, potentially, and maybe even some people who are not really faithful but who are watching this and interested, who are like, no, but he's talking about the Bible. That's that's like great and important that he's talking about the bible like how could you of course it's it's all about the bible um if if you guys don't if you guys don't mind if it's appropriate father i'd love to read just this little piece yeah, please. from saint nikolai vilimirovich because please. it it's when i read it i was like whoa okay so uh it, it's uh orthodoxy is a dramatic mystery is kind of this if people wanted to look up to, to see the rest i'm only going to read a, a, a piece of it um, so churches, shrines, chapels, icons, candles, processions, priests, bells, monasteries, traveling preachers, everyday saints, fast seasons, everything is the repetition of the same idea, namely that Christ is the ruler of life and we are his followers. Christ must be expressed everywhere, indoors and outdoors. Many Englishmen have remarked that the Bible is read very seldom in the home in Russia and Serbia. That is true. People read the Bible more in symbols, pictures and signs, in music and prayers than in the book. Our religion is not a book religion, not even a learned religion. It is a dramatic mystery. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, forgive me, Sipri, I just want to dive into Please. some stuff real quick. It's super important because this whole thing, I mean, I don't know, right? I didn't mean to do pre-production on any of this, right? But like, I don't know. But where did this thing of like people of the book, this is, to me, this is some of that ecumenical lingo that's just kind of been disseminated that no one's I think really it's. I think it's Islam. I think it's a, a Mo, I yeah. think it Mohammed was the one who came up with that term. I think. I mean, and people just 
They drink it in, man. They drink it in. We're not people of the book. We're not people of the book. And, and this idea, this is where this, you know, oh, all Abrahamic faiths, all that. It's like the, the problem for everyone else, it's fine. For us, it's unacceptable. This is, this is my position. I'm not moving from it because we are the church of Jesus Christ. Our fundamental fidelity is found in him, towards him, for him, through him, by him. Like that's, that's the thing. And this argument, you can see how it begins to open up to all these other traps, right? And this trap of the Abrahamic faiths, this, this is... I mean, I think we talked about it a couple episodes again, but you know, where is it in Dubai? The the three cubes that being built supposed to be completed next year or whatever this year. Yeah, the the world yeah. religion headquarters or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, all these movements, all these ecumenical movements. Just let's be clear. If everyone's like, "You man, fundamentalist, you guys are crazy." Let's just be real clear. Here's the problem. The problem isn't. I don't, have a, I don't have a problem with Muslims. I don't have a problem with Jews, right? Uh, I don't have a problem with them. But the thing is, is Jesus Christ is God, period. <laughs> I don't know. That's period. And so anything that would seek to undermine that truth, to me, it, it can't be tolerated. And, and that's, that's really kind of what we're getting into because even this idea was it was it John? That verse I sent you, Supreme. Is it John 15? You know, you you think the scriptures, the scriptures you study, right? And in them you think you have eternal life. Those scriptures, they speak of me. The scriptures speak of Christ, not the not the other way around. And someone, someone will say, you you're we're making too much of a semantic game out of it. It's not, because there's more to it. There, there's more to it. But the church was around for I think this is 300 this is years, be- 300 years before the book. Yeah. So I think that's something that a lot of Protestants miss. And I like I had never, of course, I knew that mm-hmm. like it wasn't something that when that was really articulated to me that it was like, oh, this is new information to me. It was like, oh, no, I knew that. Mm-hmm. But then you're like, oh, and, wh- and how could it be a book religion? How it could it possibly be. be a book religion? It can't be. And forgive me, it was John 5. It was John 5. But the this is one of the, this is, see, you, you, I think what's beginning to become ira- unraveled for a lot of people is you begin to see, it's like, when we talk about, or me in particular, I don't want to bring you guys into my, my errors or whatever, but like when I hone in on academics, right? And like, and again, like I've tried to unpack that. It's like, no, there's a place for academic theologians, but like, it has to be the proper place. Like, but this, this whole desire to be sophisticated, this whole desire to look intellectual, this whole, this, these issues that people, that Orthodox have in regards of their insecurities and just wanting so bad to be on the playing field, play with the big boys, look sophisticated, look intelligent, look educated, th- it is, this is where it becomes really dangerous because these are, these are the same people who they want to glob on to the power and, and the deafness of his, his wordsmithing and his ability to, to present these quote unquote aspects of our faith in ways that are so compelling on some that it's like, well, Instead of looking to someone else who's representing our faith improperly, then maybe people should do a better job. Are you and, talking and, about? And, and, excuse me. Are you talking about Jordan P? Is that what you're talking? Yeah, about? because that because that's the thing is they look at them. And it's and, and again, I enjoy it's <clears throat> I enjoy it too because it's just like, it's it's like candy. But there's a time when I'm like, I need to I I'm going to war. I need to eat meat. I need to be. I need to have the true sustenance, right? And he is true meat and true drink. And what's being presented, and this is this is 
fundamentally, and that's what I'm saying, at the core of it is a very Protestant, <clears throat> excuse me, understanding in regards of these, the faith is not about epistemological sources. Do you understand, you understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like the faith, <clears throat> the faith isn't about mm -hmm. collecting and trying to put together the right formula of sources of knowledge okay. by which you can now have understanding and mastery. We've talked about this before. This is one of the, this is one of the key errors of the West spiritually, right? This is where the sorcery of the West comes in spiritually. It's this, it's the magic. It's like, if I, if I have this and this at this time, exactly like this, boom. It works, right? But that's even what Peterson in that clip is even saying that's what you're supposed to do. He's mm -hmm. like, you're supposed to take all of these samples from throughout your culture and then develop this model from these samples. And then you'll, and then you'll know. And then if you look and you see, oh, well, what's the earliest place where this model is played out? Okay, well, then that must be the, the source. And he's just, he stops at the Bible. Right, right. This, this, this might be a good segue for the next yeah. clip. The next clip, which got me, this one, I almost, uh, this one, I actually had to put it down and I had to come back to it hours later because it was too much for me. Um, this is where uh, he's going to tell, he's going to tell us what is, what is God? He's going to oh. define God for us. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Glad someone is. Here we go. Uh, hold on. Let me make sure I'm sharing sound. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. It's a shorter clip, this one, I, I, I believe. Let me make sure. Uh, yes, okay. Dude has a hippie sort of doctrine, right? Uh, hold on, let me go back just a little bit. That's what's hilarious. We yeah, well, what's so, what's so cool about that, I think, is that, well, the best laid plans of mice and men, we all know that. Mm. But so there's a doctrine in the Sermon on the Mount. It's often viewed as a hippie sort of doctrine, right? Uh, the problems of the day will take care of themselves. Don't worry about the future. That is not what that sermon says at all. Not even a bit. Not a, not a bit. It says, align yourself firmly with what is the highest. So that's what you're committed to. So what is the highest? Well, we can argue about that, but we don't have to argue that much. Beauty, that, okay. Yes, truth, sure, why not? Courage, yeah, that's a good one. How about love? What's love? The desire that everything will flourish, rather than the desire that everything will suffer. So you aim at that. Aim at the highest good you can conceive of. So we'll call that God. Because we've got to call it something. And it's the integration of all things good. That's by definition. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the good? Well, the integration of all things good, that's the superordinate thing. It's ineffable. So that's God. Aim at that. And then concentrate on the day. And you'll get, not only, you won't even get what you want, because what the hell do you know? You'll get way more than you could possibly imagine. So depersonification. De mm -hmm. God is not a person. Mm -hmm. God, is, God is a metaphorical representation of love. Not that, those, not that the good things flow from the person of God. But that the even calling God a person is just a metaphor. Right. It's the force. The force. And almost not even. Because he, he's presenting it as like it's it's just our way of creating an amalgamation of these things of beauty. Yeah. Love. Right. God needs to be like, I don't know. It seemed like well, we invented God because we needed to have. That's what it is. Yes, we invented God. God that's what that's what he says. Wait, because we have to let's call it God because we have to call it something. Yeah. That is saying we invented God. That's mm -hmm. what I hear. No, that's what I hear too. And this is a key thing, and it's it's a great observation, the depersonalization, which is again ecumenical because this this pulls right in Hinduism. And all the various strata of that, whatever mm -hmm. it's going to be, right? This is this is where you have to go, you know, because to call God personal, that's just so that's so absurd. 
right? And this, mm-hmm. you know, Saint Sophroni teaches us this so clearly, right? This is this is the thing. So, yep, yep. All right, I've got another clip. We're gonna we're gonna get his whole uh, theology here. This is this is him tying in the the hero's journey to the uh, the Christian tradition. So he's gonna, which by the way, I must say, his and I mean people can go back if people want to see just how much of a fanboy I was, they could go back to my they could look up my conversation with him on my show, you know. And I mean, I told him I was like. There are, and this is, you know, this is me, this is pre-Orthodox me. And uh, I was looking for the same thing that I see a lot of these sons of Jordan Peterson looking for. And, you know, I told him, I was like, look, so far in my life, there have been like these three intellectual figures. I use the term guru who like have, they've, they've, what they've said, I've been like, yes, that's it. And it's, and it was, I said, Joseph Campbell, Alan Watts, Mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson. And, and interestingly, then when I got into orthodoxy, I found out that uh, Father, Father Seraphim Rose yeah, studied Alan under Alan Watts, yeah. right? Yeah. And it goes back to that veil thing, Father, mm-hmm. that it's like, these guys are veils. Mm-hmm. But like, once you get to the church, mm-hmm. you just see like, oh, they're just making a crude, like stick yeah. figure drawing yeah. of these concepts. Yeah. Because it's there's no experience in it. It's all intellectual. That's it. It's all intellectual. So, Father, I'm sorry. I've I've heard, and I don't know if this is an actual teaching by the church. I've heard it just within the talks of the church, like the way that like Lao Tzu softened the hearts of the people, and like some of like the Greek philosophers softened the hearts of the people ready mm-hmm. to receive Christ. Mm-hmm. Now we seem to be not necessarily. Or maybe I am and you guys aren't, but casting is kind of like not nefarious, but kind of like maybe at best, like ignorant, at worst, like villainous persona against Jordy P right now is like he couldn't. Is he not like in that same vein where he's not like maybe softening the hearts of some people? And I'm playing kind of devil's advocate here. I'm not really going to bat for this guy, but yeah, let me just, let me just say this. Let me give a really good caveat to kind of like soften what I have to say <laughs> um you know I, I've I have given clips to clips of Dr. Peterson to people who are in those traps materialism all that and you know I, I and, and again because there's it's there's some good stuff there and it gets the point right but those people have distanced themselves one person in particular I'm, sp- I'm speaking of distanced himself or they're not in Christ right? Here's why it's a different, it's categorically different. Lao Tzu, um, the kind of like um, forerunners, philosophical forerunners, uh, the Greeks, you know, I mean, for me, I'm gonna toss my man Akhenaten in there. Right? Yeah. The, the thing about it is, is that's all pre-Christ. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. all pre-Christ. Yeah. And second of all, And here's the thing. It's so hard because I know I'm saying this isn't about an ad hominem thing, but someone will probably take it this way, but I just, I have to say this. If I think the only thing to do is maybe put the blame at the feet of the Orthodox who are, who have maybe not spoken to him, who have maybe fell into some sycophancy. I, I, I don't know, but from my perspective, he's kind of come in, gotten around some priests, right? Um, gotten around some theologians, quote unquote. No one could really, no one could, no one show themselves to be alpha. And he's like, ah, right? He's already, he's already cleared the deck with all of them, right? So that's the problem is that we're talking about someone who has been we can we can go on here and we can find clips where he's talked about orthodoxy like specifically orthodoxy right so i mean he he, he's he's not ignorant of it and someone say like well yeah didn't you have this period where you and like yes and again i pray 
God grants him the kingdom, that he awakes, that he repents. But I'm just saying it's getting harder and harder because there's an inoculation that's being built up. And for as much time over these last few years where he has just been soaked deep in suffering. See, more than just him being around, because you can be around, priest doesn't mean anything, right? But the suffering that that man has been through, and this is me being charitable, that's the hand of God right there. Mm-hmm. And if you come out of that suffering without your knee being bent, because here's the thing, a lot of us, and I was one of them, I was like, okay, finally, his knee's going to bend. Because there's been the cliffs of him weeping and all this stuff. It's like, his knee's going to bend. And it's like, oh, it's not, actually. <laughs> now, it, it's just been one more of like self-realization, self-idealization, right? Um, well, and Father, he was a, what he was afflicted with, I mean he was afflicted with akathisia. Mm. That was like, and it Ak- wasn't. Akathisia, yes. what's that? Mm-hmm. What it's, is it? Well, it's the same root as akathis. It, it means he couldn't, he, he like couldn't sit. He couldn't, it, it's, a, it's some disorder where you're like a kind of like a neurological compulsion oh. where you have to stand up and walk around. That's the only thing that helps it. Yeah. If he sat down, he would be like in pain. I think it was from because he was like had a dependence basically it's coming off the benzos benzos benzodiazepines right so he got akathisia and i you know i didn't i had heard akathisia 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 and this stuff was like like he came out about what was going on like right before basically i met you father mm-hmm. and then when you gave me the akathis to do i was like wait akathis yeah like wait a minute what is and so the simple fact that he was afflicted with something that has a, that is directly tied mm-hmm. to a practice within the Orthodox Church, mm-hmm. a crucial one. Mm-hmm. That sh- that was that's a message. If that's not a like, if that doesn't get you, if you're afflicted with, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, akathist," and it's like, "Well, maybe I should sing. Maybe I should be singing these akathists. Like maybe mm-hmm. that that's what I'm being told right now." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like a person with me with a spiritual bent, right. I would have I would have been like, well, it can't hurt. You see, forgive <laughs> like, me. This is this is where I have to say to in defense of him. It seems as if people have failed him. Clergy have failed him. It seems as if he hasn't given been given any real spiritual direction. I was he's been, given, he's been given lots of philosophical, intellectual challenges and assists. But this is where this is this becomes important when we start talking about no no there's a distinction between the spiritual and the intellectual in regards to the academic realm right the philosophical realm and and it's this is a running thing where someone is being laid on the altar for the sake of well you're talking about things of christ the bible this and this and that but like it's it's important. This is where it counts, where it's like, now's not the time to talk about things about of Christ. Right? Talk about, now's not the time to talk about things related to Christ. Now's the time to talk about Christ. And, and this is where, this is where the rubber meets the road. Because to me, this becomes to some degree, the kind of pinch of incense in, in some sense where it's like, yeah, yeah okay jesus is fine you know along with the emperor and 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 saturn and everyone else it's yeah don't why why do you need to make this so difficult don't be so hardline about this just just kind of go along with this you know people are people are waking up they're seeing the value of morality they're having some respect for for tradition this is what well, this is good. Don't don't ruin a good thing, man. Just be quiet. You know? Okay. <laughs> I just I can't. Let's Cause... go with the father, let's go with this clip. I think it's I think it's um yeah. I want to I want I want to I'm almost tempted to pull in the, the last clip, which is he, it's the only time he mentions Christ. Mm-hmm. I'm almost tempted to pull it in, but let me let me just let me just go and grab it because it's re- because it's related it's it's related to this and I think maybe it's maybe it's important it's right it's I've I've got it right here let me um uh, it's the one time he talked about Christ and it the reason 
Well, it's just, I, I mean, I'll, I'll play it. It's, there's a lot wrong, but let me just go ahead and, uh, let me go ahead and pull it up. Hold on. Is the audio on? Order. And so that's essay. And yes, like audio? I said, I think yeah. if you go to my website or to essay.app, essay.app, or to my website, academic, most people come through. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be chancellor of a university, uh, Ross, university. Just... Here. Okay. It was thought that I realized some things about the Exodus story, okay, an updated version of my Maps of Meaning course. I compressed it from 40 hours to nine, which took me like 40 years to do. This one's kind of long, but it's... 40, 35 years to do. Oops, come on. Oh, well. There's a scene in there in the Exodus story where God sends poison okay make courses that'll be a free oh that'll be goodness. i got I'm way sorry, deeper guys. into his Here thought than i'd ever been able to at the university and then i recorded an updated version of my maps of meaning course i compressed it from 40 hours to nine which took me like 40 years to do 40 35 years to do oh goodness wow you know it did this to me every single time it's something very strange make courses. there that'll be a free here let's try it here Worse, the desert. Okay, hold so on. Could I am so sorry. Could at about least this, in part everyone. address that problem. It's a massive problem. It's a massive problem, right? Most. Okay, we'll try it here. Let's see what happens. He's talking about the Exodus story. Oh my! Of course, I compressed it from forty hours to nine. It took me like forty <laughs> years to do. It does not. Forty, thirty-five. Look at look at how do. it's stopping right there. Could be Providence or something. It 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 did that. Make to, it did that to me, as I was trying to misconceptions and misperceptions Here we go. psychologically and socially. So let's say we we free ourselves from those. Exodus story. Well, then we're nowhere. At least we were guided by that. That's why people have nostalgia for tyranny. It's like at least we had enough to eat then. At least we knew wh who we were then. It's like out of the tyrant's grasp, mm -hmm. into the desert. And so you think, why don't people want to challenge their own preconceptions? It's like, yeah, it's out of the tyranny into the desert. And the worse the tyranny, the worse the desert. So if you've been tormenting yourself with tyrannical preconceptions and totalitarian obligations and you decide to drop it, or maybe you're shocked out of that by trauma, you don't go to paradise. You go to the desert. Maybe that's even worse. And so no wonder people don't do it. So now the Israelites are out in the desert. You think, why are they there for 40 years? And maybe it's because it takes three generations to recover from tyranny. You're in the desert, man. And so the Israelites start worshiping idols. It's ideology. It's the same thing. And that's why, because they don't have anything to orient themselves because they're not ty tyrannized anymore. And they get all fractious and they fight with themselves. And Moses has to st spend like all day judging their conflicts because otherwise they're at each other's throats. And... Anyways, they turn to false idols. And so God isn't very happy about this. And he sends poisonous snakes in there to bite them. So it's like <laughs> out of the tyr tyranny, into the desert. Now we're fractured by ideologies. Now the poisonous snakes come. And so the poisonous snakes are biting them and biting them and <laughs> biting them. And they finally break down and go to Moses and say, look, you want to have a chat with God and get him to call off the damn snakes and Moses says yeah okay and so he goes and talks to God and God says this is weird this is one of those impossibly weird stories you think this is either insane or it's true because that's the only options it's not boring it's not predictable it's either insane or it's true okay and maybe we could start by thinking it's insane but whatever Moses talks to God and God God could just call off the snakes, right? That's what you'd expect him to do. But that isn't what happens. He says, go make an image of a snake in bronze and make an image of a stick, like a staff, and put the snake on the staff and then stick it in the ground. And then have the Israelites go and look at the snake. And then the snakes won't bite them anymore. And you think, what the hell is... That's the same symbol physicians use. Why do you think that that would be insane or true? Well, what does it mean? 
What the hell does that mean? Well, like, what's what he does up to? many of the stories from the Bible mean? Well, what that's is what we're trying Jesus to figure out. Jesus coming back from the dead. People yeah. Walking well, we're on not water. Gonna, Moses we're not gonna parting be able the to get, Red Sea. No, we're not, not. going to be able to get all there, but we no. can get to this one. Okay. Okay, so. The Caduceus. Yeah. Yes. Same symbol. Do you, you know the, the the links to that in Mesopotamia? Yeah. And, yeah, the yeah, ancient yeah. Sumerians. Yeah, yeah, they, and it's they, a it snake that sheds its skin. Yeah, I know. It's a symbol yeah. of transformation. But they also think it might have had roots in the double helix of DNA. That's with the the wacky conspiracy theorists. Yeah, and I know. They go deep I know. down the rabbit hole. I know. Hole I talked the, about that. Richard Dawkins stripped stripped my skin off when I went to Oxford to talk to him about that. He said. You said that under some conditions, shaman, shamanic people might be able to see DNA. It's like, that's complete nonsense. It's yeah, like, he doesn't know. Well, he, the, the problem with Richard Dawkins is he's had zero psychedelic experiences. If you have psychedelic experiences, you see all kinds of iconography from ancient Egypt. You see hieroglyphics. You see geometry. Yeah, uh, but is that, true or, is that true or insane? But it doesn't matter if it's true or insane. It's repeatable. <laughs> you, could, you could have it over and over. I mean, people who take mushrooms and people who take dimethyltryptamine have these kind of images. They happen all the time. Yeah. It's not uncommon. So yeah. the idea that it's impossible for those people from thousands of years ago to actually see the double helix pattern of DNA says who? Well, I'm glad you said it and not me. Me. I'll no. say it. Okay. Oh, like, look at Richard Dawkins. Is a brilliant man. Yes. But he stands on this foundation of a lack of experience, the lack of experience of psychedelics. And he's he's t been tempted to do it before under clinical settings. And he's talked about it, yeah. but he's never done it. Yeah. So the idea that that's preposterous, everything when you're on psychedelics is preposterous, <laughs> but they're real. Not real life, in the man. sense of you can put it on a scale, yeah. but real in the sense of if I give you DMT, you will fucking go there. You will go there just like everybody goes there. And if you try to hang on, good luck. You're going to get shot through a cannon to the center of the universe, and that's just how it goes. And so you can either have experienced that or you're talking out of your ass. So if you say, do you think those people thousands of years ago could have had a shamanic experience where they saw the double helix pattern of DNA? Yeah. Yeah, and you can too. You can too. And it's not just because you know what the double helix pattern of DNA is, because you can also see souls. You can also see the the, the, the very so you're talking components. just like the conservative that everyone thinks you are. <laughs> yeah, that's so back me, bro. To this, let's go back to this okay. story. Okay. Okay. So, so so the snake. You the have staff. to go look on the snake. Yes. Okay. Here's a doctrine from all fields of psychotherapy. Okay. Look at what you're terrified of, and you will get braver. Unless what you're terrified of is a pack of yeah. wolves and they're yeah. going to fucking eat you. Yeah, well, look, it's not like there aren't real dangers. But look, yeah. if you're threatened by a pack of wolves and you go out and study them. You'll realize you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have guns. Okay, so so the, the classic therapeutic treatment for terror and the poisoning that terror induces is exposure, voluntary exposure. exposure. Yeah. Okay, so, so the, the, the pattern there is face, face what you're... Face what you're most afraid of, right. and you will be free. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Voluntarily. Yeah. Now, that's a doctrine of psychotherapy now. Right. Okay. So, now, that's weird. That's mm. weird. So, God doesn't chase away the snakes. He makes everyone braver. Mm. Okay, because that's better than being safe. Bravery is better than safety. It's a more reliable cure for terror. Okay, now, that's cool. But this is even more cool. In the Gospels, Christ says that he has to be lifted up like the serpent in the desert. You think, what the hell does that possibly mean? Because, well, that's a snake first on a stick. It's, and Christ is comparing himself to a snake on a stick? Okay, so what is this? what can this possibly mean? Well, I was thinking about that in relationship to imagery of the crucifix and the story that surrounds it. So Jung thought that the passion story was archetypal because it's a limit story like this <laughs> this debate at Oxford you cannot write a more tragic story it's impossible technically why well because it's a story of the aggregation of everything that people are afraid of so there was no death more painful than crucifixion that's why the Romans invented it, it was to punish 
political miscreants was the slow agonizing death by suffocation essentially and 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 dehydration and exposure it's extraordinarily painful okay so that sucks that's pain man plus you know it's coming that's part of the story plus your best friend betrayed you into it plus your people turned against you plus they're led by a tyrant who doubts truth plus you're a victim of the Roman Empire plus you're completely innocent plus everybody knows it plus they they choose a criminal to be released from this experience instead of you even though they know he's a criminal and they know you're innocent so and you're young and you've done no wrong and all you've done is help people so it's a limit story okay so then you think we've been looking at that limit story for 2,000 years in the image and in the story what are we doing well you're supposed to visit the stations of the cross let's say okay here's the idea you hear the crucifixion story and you play with it who are you maybe if you're female you're Mary and why is that it's the Pieta because you have to offer your children to the destruction of the world that's female courage that's the mother that doesn't hold her child back it's like go out to what eventually your death and destruction go out leave me be in the world that's feminine courage man to let her baby go you're a pilot you doubt truth but you're you'll go along with the crowd you're Judas because you betray your best friend you're the mob you're the criminal all of that that's you you look on all those things that you hate and are terrified by that's like that's not a snake it's like the worst of all possible snakes everywhere that's what you're looking at and what do you see you see death you see destruction pain terror tyranny frailty betrayal look harder look harder look harder what do you see the death and resurrection you look far enough into the abyss you see the light well that's the story that's the connection between those stories I can't hear you, Cyprian. Before, before my catechism, I would have bought that fully. I would have been like, what I just heard, that, oh, that was so brilliant. So brilliant. Everything that he said was so brilliant. Except the weirdest part about that is he, he actually told the story wrong. Because he said, and that was the part that jumped out at me like immediately. And I, because he said, the first thing that he said where I was like, something's going to be wrong in this whole thing was that he said they looked at the snake they looked at the bronze serpent the brass serpent and then the snakes left them alone but that's not what happens in the story in the story the snakes continued to bite them but what it was was that every time they got bitten if they looked at the snake they would live mm -hmm. look and live and then that when he says it's and it's so weird that he says well, what does that mean when Christ compares himself to the serpent? What does that mean? It's like it's John 3.14, which is so weird that he would say that because John 3.16 is like even every Protestant has that like on the back of their truck. Because Christ says, I'm going to be lifted up in the same way that whoever believes in me won't die, but will have eternal life. It's I'll not draw all men unto me. Yep. It's not, but Father, it's so crazy that he's like, First, he tells the story wrong, and then he says that the point of the story is to look at something horrible so that you get more brave. Like, that's right. not even Face close. your fears. Right, right. And this is why this is so dangerous. Because what it does is, I just had this thought, too, not to, before we got into this clip. Our last episode in this episode, there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a theme where I definitely see, and it's not intentional, but this theme of, of trying to warn people of like, because something is trying to put the church on the stage and God is going to use it. I have no doubt. Right. But I just feel like we need to say, because remember last time we were talking, you know, a little bit more explicitly about um, the exposure to orthodoxy um, of libertarians. Right. And, 
I think for me, the big moral was that's great, but understand what this is about. It's not about Byzantium. It's not about, you know, finding some sort of like cultural underpinning that can keep people together. This is about salvation. And it's about God became flesh and dwelt among us and revealed the light of who the father is to us. Like, this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about abstract meaning. This is, this is that spirit. It's the same thing. You know, this is what we talked about last time. This is what we're talking about today again. And this is my concern. There are people who hear what he's saying and hear the, the interesting and beneficial portions of what he's saying, but they will mistake what is interesting and beneficial for what is good and what is of God. And they're, they're not the same. And it's important because I remember there was someone even at one point in time who was kind of wrestling with you a little bit when you were telling them early in your conversion, Sabrina, about like, like, yeah, this is true. And like, yeah, it's like, well, hold on. You don't really believe in like, you know, like man upstairs and stuff. You're like, no, no, yeah, I do. And it's just like that, that type of need to make all of this something sophisticated, slick, sexy, dangerous, all everything but the, the simple fundamental truth that God became flesh and that in him only is there life. Because what is being sold underneath all of this is that really, you know, you have life, you have life within you and of yourself. You just need to deal with all the bad habits that you got going on. But once you deal with those bad habits, you work through those things, you kind of, you, 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 you slough off some of your ignorance, you can tap into what's inside of you. But that's, that's, that's the spirit of the world, isn't it? It's the spirit of the world Self -centered. And, and getting back full circle, hard statement, but this is what I mean by when I say antichrist, everybody. Understand this is this is what I'm saying, you know, and we get the whole thing, but it's just like it, it's antichrist if it doesn't great people the wrong way. <laughs> Wait, so oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so antichrist will have the slickness, will have the sophistication, will have you going. Just like, just like I said, like I would have fully bought into that. Like, yeah, man, that's great. If it doesn't you know, grate yeah. people the wrong way, listen, the Lord grates even his followers the wrong way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That, listen, what is the process of, of salvation according to the Orthodox understanding that is revealed to us by the Holy Fathers and the Holy Spirit in the light of the church? Purification, illumination, deification, but you need to have that purification. You need to have that purification. And that Christ brings, every time Christ shows up, something's going to go wrong. Your best laid plans are going to go wrong. Every All these things are going to go wrong because what needs to happen is we need to be purified of that foreign spirit, that satanic spirit, that luciferic spirit that says, no, I'm going to ascend and be the most high. And everything... And I, and I know it's just a hard saying, I know it is, but he, he isn't positing these things in such a light to draw people to Christ. Cause some people be like, no, 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 take it easy. He's drawing people to Christ. But I'm like, but is he? I don't think he is. I, I don't think he is. And I, again, I'll say it again. You know, I'm not trying to be, you know, mushy middle of the road, I honestly sincerely pray that he does repent because there's been ample enough ex exposure to Christ in his church for him personally. I, I didn't get all the way through that clip, but in that clip, 
he actually, and maybe I should just, I think it's like two, maybe I'll just pop it back on so that it's not me saying it and it's, I'm misquoted. And the misquoted. unbelievably strange thing but is, is that connection exists. He says like, about the literary truth of Christ. There's the strange so he, story of the serpent in the desert. And we know that story is 3,000 years old, something like that. We know that. And then we know perfectly well that Christ said that he was allied, that his image was allied with that snake. That's written down. And even if you don't believe in the historical reality of Christ, someone still made that connection. Even if you don't believe in the historical reality of Christ, someone still made that connection. Yeah. So, I mean, anybody who would say, oh, no, he's drawing people to Christ. It's like, how could somebody who would, where there's even would be like, no, I'm open to the idea that Christ didn't actually, I'm open to that. Like, how could somebody who says that be drawing you to, well, somebody who says that can't even, they can't even say the creed. No, no. And this is, and this is what's troubling because there's many people who can say the creed, but are maybe getting a little bit watered down now a little bit drawn aside from the truth of the creed. And for what? You know, friendship with the world is enmity towards God. You can't, you can't serve God and mammon. <laughs> can't do both. I mean, yeah, I've, I've heard like from recollections of like saints and um, I mean, not so much fathers although i'm sure that they're out there that that saints are like pretty and like oh uh, well i mean but like annoying they were grading like um they were like of course you had your love and you had your like oh it's just wonderful to be around them but they also were like meticulous i mean saint john of san francisco i had heard and father correct me if i'm wrong please but he had faced some ire because he was very strict with the altar boys mm -hmm. he was very very strict with them and that earned the ire of some of the parents and some of the members of his church were that like um or the people who went to his church because he's like what are you doing being so harsh to their kids I'm like, this is the altar of god you know yeah. like you know and things like that and then mother um a mother we know a nun that we know said that there was this story and i don't know these saints or anyone but there's, they were traveling all day and they got to their hotel at the end of the day, been walking all day long. And the saint said to the, the regular person, all right, it's time to do our prayer rule. The other guy was like, no, I'm going to bed. He's like, no, 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 we got to do our like, you know, I'm sure like two hour, hour and a half prayer rule or something like that. So like, you know, these weren't easy people necessarily all the time to get along with. And like the fact that like, there's this guy in a tux with the slicked back hair talking about all these like, supposedly reconciling the intellect of the world with like the troubling quote unquote troubling parts of Christianity and how you can all make it work in one package if you just kind of buy into some of the things that he's willing to say or whatever then I mean yeah run far away that's and my it, take it, on it anyway it it feels throughout it it felt like maybe I don't know this is what he was trying to do but what like I tried to put myself in the me that first discovered Jordan Peterson and how, what, what would have been my feeling about him saying this? And my feeling in some ways would have been, Oh, I don't need the Bible. Oh, I don't need scripture. Yeah. Oh, I don't need Christ. Oh, I get it. I can find all of those things. And I feel like that's the theology that he's building. I can find all of those things in all kinds of places in my culture. Like these are just, echoes of the same thing but i could find it in any of these other places and it's just like this is a good place because it's all sort of there like it's it's a it's a good place that i can go into also one of the things that kicked off to me and the fact that he this is the one time in this thing that he references the new testament and that he basically gets it wrong and is like what is what does this mean something where it's like go one verse further and you're being told what it means dude but you know, the, the, which was in my catechism, but like, this was one of the saints that you brought up when we were talking about spiritual delusion was, um, that was the next saint, thing I was going to say. Yeah. Saint, saint Nasitas, Saint Nasitas of Novgorod. <clears throat> and the, the story for the people that don't know, like this one really struck me hard 
or maybe I, I don't know, Father, if you want to tell the story or or hey, if, if you want away, me Father. to, or if Andrew wants to do it. I don't want to. I'd rather have Father do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, St. Nicetus, um, which by the way, for me, it was like one of those game changers too. I mean, my my second son, it's his patron. Or my second youngest son, it's his patron, you know. Um, St. Nicetus basically being a monastic and um, wanting to enter into like the hermetic life, you know, he wants to become a hermit, which is super advanced and, and um, very dangerous and not, not to be taken into lightly and his abbot, you know, basically saying like, no, you can't do that, you know? Um, and he persists and he eventually you know, gets his way, okay. And he is, you know, in a cave and he's, you know, asceticizing and he's, he's, you know, doing the things that, you know, monks do, praying, denying himself, all this stuff. And one night an angel uh, appears to him, the, the cave fills with light angel begins to speak to him and basically says to him, you know, you know, basically to see this God has seen your prayer. He's seen your struggle. What would you ask the Lord? He says, you know, I want prayer. And the angel says, okay, well, when I appear at night, I will pray for you. I will, I'll pray in your stead and this will be, you know, be accounted to you and all this stuff. And he says, when I appear, um, study the scriptures you have with you, right? The copy of the Testament the scriptures, study the scriptures with and so the angel would come and he'd, you know, go in the corner and lift his hands and pray. And uh, at night, and the Cetus would study, say the scriptures. Well, he eventually begins to travel out and, excuse me, word gets around and he's able to, you know, have word of knowledge and give prophetic utterances and tell people things. And the, the people are just amazed by his, uh, you know, the, his, his, powers you know he's he's able to predict predict and say things and tell them all kinds of stuff and the abbot comes with some of the brethren and they you know hey let's check out the, the local elder in town we heard there's new a new gun in town and they go and lo and behold you know here's Nicetus and he is he's actually prophesying and telling people you know words of knowledge of the future and you know telling them about themselves but the Holy Spirit gives the abbot discernment and, and the, the tip off the Holy Spirit used was Mesitas was only quoting the Old Testament. And so from there, the abbot realizes that he's in prelist. He's in spiritual delusion. And they grab him, you know, and he's given exorcism, penance, and he eventually he repents of his delusion and ends up becoming an actual wonder worker and a saint and a bishop. Now, if you don't get it by now, let me make it really pl plain to you. That angel that appeared was a demon. That angel was a demon and led him into all these things. And remember the Lord said in John 10, I believe it's, it's 10. Um, in that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy your name? Do we not work miracles in your name? No, do we not cast out demons in your name? He'll say, away from me, you, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. So this portion of scripture ties directly to this, to this uh, life of St. Nicetus. Remember, boys and girls, the lives of the saints are the living out of the gospel. That's, and this is so important to say because um, that quote that uh, uh, Nikolai had given uh, Cyprian from St. Nikolai, about you know how we experience the Bible. And, and let's just be clear, all of my spiritual children know I'm all about reading the scriptures. So let's just be clear. This is not about not reading the scriptures. I love the scriptures. Um, and this isn't even about trying to tear down the man of Jordan Pearson, you know, make again, make God grant him repentance. But let's just be clear about what this is, right? And the the scriptures that you think, the scriptures you study that you think in them you have eternal life, the, those scriptures, they speak of me. It's Christ. And the church experiences Christ, yes, through the scriptures, but also through iconography, hymnography, primarily through the Eucharist. 
the lives of the saints, they are the ones who live out the gospel. For some people, this may be scandalous, but for some people, they might be safer reading the lives of the saints than the scriptures directly. Because for some people, their tendency to being, you know, twisted and deluded and, and misinterpreting the scriptures can be so high that you might be safer reading the lives of the saints on your own and, and speaking with the spiritual father and having proper commentary with the reading of the scripture. You, you see what I'm saying? This is why, it's another reason why what he's saying, it just what he's saying is not orthodox. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's nothing orthodox about what he's saying. But because he's speaking in the Bible, people are losing their mind. And, you know, you believe in one God, you do well. The demons believe in one God and tremble, as James says. We need to be more discerning as, as just believers and people. We just need to be more discerning. I mean, what's he going to say that hasn't already been said and better? Like, I don't know. I mean, there was the, the, the fact that in the first clip, he says, you know, I just figured this out last week. That was one of the yeah, things. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I caught that too. I was like, yeah. 2000 year old tradition. And, and, and forgive me, it's kind of unfortunate too, because one of the things I'm thinking about here too, especially with this whole portion with the, the serpent of brass, and especially for me, because like this is one of my jams I've been on for years. You know what I mean? For years and years and years. Um, but aside from that, it's like, what about your boy, Jonathan? And Jonathan's the one who introduced him, you know, to, to the Orthodox world at large. Uh, I mean, Jonathan's got some great analysis and interpretation of uh, an exegesis of those scriptures. And it's just like, it's, it's almost like, it's one more point where I go like, are you just disregarding all of these years of, of direct contact and interface with the church? It sounds like you are. Because for me, it's like, okay, how are you going to talk so explicitly about the scriptures when you've been hobnobbing with priests, you know, of the Orthodox Church and, and you know, one of your good friends or whatever, Jonathan Bajot, is like you've, you're, and who's at a real high level of analysis, right? And you're just going to ignore that? I, I, it's, it's off. It's off. He's name dropping all these other things. So it's always not a problem. He doesn't have a problem name dropping. He didn't drop name drop Jonathan Pajot. He sure didn't. He didn't sure he didn't drop the Orthodox Church. He didn't drop the fathers. No. How are you gonna talk about the scriptures and not talk about and again? It'd be different if this was a Jordan Peterson from six years ago or however right. many years ago. Right. That's that's why this is so kind of that's why I'm being so critical. Because this isn't a man who doesn't know any better. The, and again, the biggest thing is the pain that he's went through. Right? Pain will teach you everything. Right? It'll teach you humility, which is the key thing. And I don't know. I don't know. Well, Father, this is... And as, as you said earlier, but maybe to underline it, because I didn't, I didn't think that it would be Jordan Peterson that was going to do what it looks like he's doing. I thought it was going to be someone else, um, but like building on Jordan Peterson. That's why I came with, came and coined that sons of son, the sons of Peterson mm -hmm. term. But it is, was a big reason why we're even doing this Royal Path project in the first place, which is sort of interesting that we're at this point and then here comes this interview where it's sort of like the thing is happening because my concern is this christian is this christianism like not christianity but right. christianism where yeah. people are saying well there's power in the bible there's power in the way that the church organizes itself and it you're seeing book of eli that's what i was i was i was gonna mention that you're seeing book of eli i mean that's 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 Gary um, Gary Oldman, Oldman's right? Character. Gary Oldman, yeah. yeah. That's Gary Oldman's character. Who's yeah. a who's a complete evil tyrant? Yeah, I mean, this is Hitler. Yeah, Hitler well, 
That's Flip Hitler it. was getting the relics. Yeah. Hitler was going out and getting the relics. Yeah, we get that spirit destiny, boy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like whatever, whatever the thing is. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's I don't know. It's More unfortunate. Fun. It's unfortunate, but I think this is important because this we're at a. I won't say we're at a time. I'll just say, for for me, for us who are here, it's just important. I want to see people come to the church. Lord knows, I, I, it's it's one of the, it's one of my biggest joys in my life is to see people come to the church. But I want people. I want people to. I want to see people come to the church for the right reason, which is because they want to be united to Jesus Christ. If you want power, if you want meaning, if you want enough cultural inertia to start a revolution and push back whatever things that you don't like, go join the Shriners, the Masons, the Elks. Go join the Marines. Go, go do that. You know. Go, go start like a CID unit in your town and pick up trash. You know what I mean? Like, go do that. That's not, that's not the church. The church, she can do that, but that's not, she is the body of the living God. That's, that's what this is about. And if, and if you can't really get behind that, then I, I, I just, this isn't the place, you know? More like Jordan Prelis son. Oh gosh. Ba, ba, ba. Where's where's the hook? <laughs> there it is. Well, I think we're how close are we to two hours there, Andrew? We're, we're at it. We're good. Yeah. All right. What uh what do you guys like on your nachos? Because I know mm. that this does vary. Do you like? Do you, you like- know, man? I'm gonna tell you something. I'm. I come from a certain time in a certain place. I, I came at a. I came into the world in Southern California at a time when nachos were hitting their peak of creativity. Right mm. on. I'm into this. So, I mean, I've had. I'll make you some nachos sometimes. I mean, I'll, I'll put. What do you want? You know, I, I've done uh, barbecue chicken nachos with jalapenos, That's black great. olives, and pepper jack cheese. I, I've done ground beef. I've done, it's almost like a pozole type of nacho. Ooh, that sounds good. You know, I mean, that's the thing about the power of the nacho is you can... <laughs> Power of the nacho. That should be the name of the episode. I mean, it shouldn't be, but it should you, be. Power you can do... You can you can do so much. You can do so much with a nacho. What if you were to go to a restaurant and I blindly order some nacho and they brought it out to you and you were disappointed? What would those nachos look like? Soggy. Soggy. Yeah. yeah. I can do soggy. I especially at the bottom with like a fork. It's like kind of like nacho soup at that point. Like no, I, I mean when they bring them out, they should not be soggy. Oh, I understand. I understand if they've been sitting there for a little while, if I've been eating them, if it's a lot of them. But still, I feel like if you do the layers correctly, like, for instance, you have to have a bean, have a bean layer. Got okay? layer. You got to have a refried beans layer. Do not do yeah, that's, that's soggy that's beans. The beans boy. can't be soggy. They have to be well cooked refried beans. And then you then the, the, the chips won't get soggy. But yeah. see, some of the best nachos I've ever had were actually from a chain restaurant, chain corporate okay. restaurant, and they don't even serve them anymore. So sorry, but it's Nachos Grande from Old Chicago. Okay, it was not refried beans. They put whole black, black beans? beans on it, and it was yeah. oh oh. Well, see, that's what that's what Papadia does now. A lot of times she makes nachos for the kids. It's black beans. The only time we have refried beans with our nachos is, is if I'm making them. We're both from California, by the way. Both California natives, hmm. right? But when my wife makes them, she'll do the black beans. So a lot of times that's what the kids grown up on. But you know, when daddy makes them, it's a special time. Because mm-hmm. I got a little something extra special I put on my, my refried beans that makes people just forget about everything they've ever done in their life. <laughs> I love refried beans. It's, it's incredible. Oh, I mean, they're fantastic. And I mean, when you can get them to that right consistency where there's not like a big glob, 
Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. You're in a big glob right there, but it runs evenly throughout. Mm-hmm. Let me just throw this out there. I don't care because you know what? I just like bacon grease. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, and well, now we know what to do with the bacon grease. Yeah. Now you yeah, know what to do bacon grease. grease. Shout out to you, my man. Bacon <laughs> grease and cinnamon. Cinnamon. Ooh. Okay. You I you know what? This- I can see, I can see that. You gotta have just the right touch, but you put some cinnamon and bacon grease in those refried beans. Last question. You're welcome. Topic, what's your protein of choice? If you had to choose, if you're making nachos right now and you've got a bunch of protein, oh, in the nachos, yeah. shredded chicken. But it's so- but it, but ro- but like already cooked rotisserie. That's what I'm going with. Like, I, okay. I want a juicy, juicy chicken rotisserie, but I want it shredded yeah. in there. Okay. Then we're going to do the stuff. Then we're going to do the cheese. Then we're going to pop it in the oven and just melt the cheese. Yeah, yeah. Boom. There. You know what does not sound good to me is shrimp nachos. I've never had some shrimp nachos. They, I've, I've, I've had them, but you know what you do with shrimp nachos is you don't, and I wish I knew what kind of cheese they had put on it, but it, it was a more kind of a almost like a sour it was appropriate for the taste it's it wasn't like a cheddar cheese or something like that you know but it was almost like a cheese sauce that they did it was very very shishi when i had them shrimp they were great though shrimp not yeah. i would almost have to do it right i think steak i think steak is probably my protein of choice if i'm sitting there looking at it just some really charred charred steak just like some little cubes thrown mm-hmm. on top just like and work Sounds, through now. I may have to. I may have to do nachos. I may do nachos for lunch. It's lunchtime. And what yes. you want to try? You want if you can do it, Cyprian. Get yourself. Yes. Get your chicken. Do what you got to do. Whatever. Why don't you go ahead and treat yourself? Put some bacon on that. Oh, I think I will do that. Just sprinkle some bacon on it. <laughs> like chop, like chopped up bacon. Just sprinkle yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could. Oh, yeah. Of course, I could get with that. And what you want to do is you want to make sure you don't overcook the bacon. So that when it's in the when it's in the oven, oh, then it gets you get the, the proper extra. crisp. Yeah, just a little prep, just a little just, prep just on little the bacon. Prep, just to, oh. your, cadence, your cadence and your delivery of you're talking about bacon, father. If I were writing a show, I would make a character based around you that their whole thing is just bacon. It's wow. just like, yo, I'm, that's a bacon is a. Hey, I'm not knocking bacon. I mean, I did in the other episode, but I'm saying it is good. Like bacon is good, but it's like, man. I just don't know what to do about. I got. I think. I, these... I think some people are bacon people and some people aren't, though, Andrew. Oh, without honest. a doubt, without a yeah, doubt. Yeah. But it, like it my my kids are like... my kids are nuts for bacon and they're oh, absolutely daughter, crazy for it. And there's another amazing reason why my daughter should always eat bacon is, and it's she just it helps her move the bowels. The grease helps move her bowels, and she has constipation issues. So I'm all about. Get, I don't even like sop up the bacon grease off of the bacon before I give it to her. I'm like, just take the grease, take all of it. And she just sits there and just sops it up. I'm like, yeah, just get it going. Just <laughs> cool with that. Bacon's good, man. But it would be like, I, I don't know what to do about these. Like, you know, I got to make this cake by tomorrow. Then in walks Father Turbo's character. He's like, see, what you got to do is you got to mince some onions, mix them with some bacon, saute it. Let me say this one last thing, well, then we'll go. And my boys want to fight me on this, but they know what's right. They know what's good. <laughs> you know, you you get yourself two scoops of vanilla, French vanilla. It has to be French. French yeah. vanilla ice cream. Right? You know you know, talking about the mm-hmm. French vanilla? Yep, yep, little, yep, yep. Little pepper in it, right? Yep. French vanilla ice cream, right? And what you got to do is you got to have extra crispy bacon it's gotta be not burnt but extra crispy right make sure it's got that crisp in it you sprinkle a healthy sizable amount of the bacon over the uh two mounds of french vanilla ice cream right and then you just drizzle just maple just, syrup maple syrup baby you oh, yeah. <laughs> drizzle, I was you drizzle. <laughs> just no i was tasting it in syrup. my mouth <laughs> A little bit of maple syrup on that bad boy, and if and if you're feeling real, this is where you know these this could be optional or not, but I always have handy some uh, espresso dust, mm. and I would just tap tap mm. it, 
I just tap, tap a little bit of espresso dust on it just to give it some color, just to give it a little bit of just that, mm. just tap, tap that espresso dust on top of mm. that, after the, on top of that drizzled maple syrup. Whew. Ooh, that's a win. I'm telling you, man. That's that's... I can, I can never give that to my kids because they will, they will be asking me for that every single day. I'm so they're going to have to wait until they're older because I'm not going to make that for them every day, I'm, but I'm, I'm going to make it for myself. I'm <laughs> we are a baking house in this house. We, we have bacon grease. We keep it around for the, for, especially for my daughter's aforementioned malady. <laughs> Just try and make sure that everything's running smoothly and, you know, eggs, she doesn't, she's not crazy about eggs. So bacon, just give her some bacon and some maple syrup. You if you cook those eggs in bacon grease, she'll like it. <laughs> I think it's a consistency thing because I struggle with the same thing. And we don't have to get into Trust it. Me. Trying to Trust end it. I, I, I always cook my eggs in bacon grease. You got to. Yeah. I have to like, I have to really, and again, I know we got to go, but I just have to really like, it's a mind over matter with eggs. I eat them for the protein. I eat them oh, just so I can I like. I love eggs. Down. I love them. No. I love them. I've also gotten sick multiple times off my off eggs. I got well, that's my- that's what'll do it. So yeah, that's I, what'll do it's it. Just a mind over matter thing. I don't want to eat a bunch of sausage or bacon, like a ton of it, as a way of like filling up my stomach in the morning. So I got to do eggs. So it's kind of just like you can just get them down, just like shove them down, just to get them there. So anyway, um, so um, I think that's it. Uh, again, we're not like looking to tear this dude down um two of these three guys on this podcast at one point were really big fans of jordan peterson and it it was him that changed not not well we all changed but it seemed like he had a trajectory and something just like knocked him way the heck over here and he's off in some unknown lands he's just down a path we can't really follow right now um i never was really crazy about him but we're not sitting here just trying to bash him and then you know if if something we said you know, was off the mark in any way, if we came across harsher, or if I, I should say, if I came across harsher against this guy, then I should have, I apologize. I still don't really know a terrible lot about the dude. And that's kind of good because I'm going to kind of stick with that. So um, I've, you know, I mean, I've, just to make, make it simple. It's not about Jordan Peterson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, that's, it's about, it's about the spirit and the message, which is going to be picked up and it's, not only is it going to be picked up by someone else, it's already spoken by so many other people mm-hmm. in so many other religious contexts and other secular contexts. He just happens to be on the stage, but more importantly, he, unlike all those other people, has had direct influence, context, and experience with orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. He's been in colloquiums with orthodox priests. Is, you know what I mean? That's the problem. I mean, if that's, something, that's the problem, just for, okay. that's the problem. So I, well, yes, of course, okay. I, I agree, of course. But I, I, the, as a lay person, just not as a priest, not telling everybody what to do. If, if something about him is speaking to you, go read Saint Nikolai, like Velomirovich. Like, you want to talk about, like, mm-hmm. I don't know, you want to talk about a guy that's like has something to say. I mean, I could go on and on, but that one quote from that Cyprian read from him, it was like, it's gold. It's Mm -hmm. gold. It's just like sitting there. It's gold. It's beyond measure. I mean, I I don't know. I I could go on and on, but like, if you're an Orthodox, forgive me. If like, if you're an Orthodox Christian and you find yourself like you need Jordan Peterson, something's wrong with you. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. And like, and I know that's harsh. I'm just saying, because I've run into brothers like that and I've had to get them off of him. I've done it before. I've gotten other people off of him. Something's wrong with you because Jordan Peterson is, is good for, for we already no need to rehash the whole show. Right. But the thing is, is if you're in Christ and you, and you're going more to him than the fathers, Mm -hmm. right. If you don't know what to go to, put a little thing in there, send an email. I'll give you more patristic writing that you'll know what to do with. You'll never need to go to Jordan Peterson again. Right, because none of the advice he's going to give you. If you're an Orthodox Christian, why do you want to eat the slop of pigs when you have the feast of a king in front of you? I was going to say silk almond milk rather than like a steak. 
like why not sit down with like a steak which is like the father's or like you're like little wimpy like watered down like silk almond milk or something like mm-hmm. it's like no why not why not listen to a guy who was in a concentration camp yeah. like why not listen to that guy like i think he's got a little bit more to say so um okay yeah we're still anytime you guys have a question feel free to email it to us or leave it in the youtube comments uh we'll probably do another q a before too long but i think we're going to continue on next week um and then uh coming for too long i think we're working out that we're going to put the audio up just the audio from the episodes Mm -hmm. i think we're going to put them up i'm not sure on what platform quite yet cipri and i talked about a little bit before but we're going to kind of roll and see what the best way to do that is because I know sometimes people, myself included, have a hard time with YouTube, just sitting there watching YouTube, mm-hmm. um, especially if you're working and stuff like that. So um, we're going to try that. But beyond that, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.